our next guest is Mateusz Rublewski from 11-Bit Studios. Who heard about this studio? So do you know that this company uh, is listed on a stock exchange? If you don't know, you should try to check, uh, check them there because uh, during the last two years probably, um, the amount of the, the sum of all um, stock is, is all stocks of this company is uh, like 20 times more higher than it was two years ago. So it's, if you invested in this company two years ago, you could 20 times, uh, you have 20 times more money right now. So maybe it's worth to hear what we can hear from Mateusz today. Maybe we know some new things from the company. And maybe it's worth to, to invest still. Okay, please welcome Mateusz. So, hi everyone. My name is Mateusz Rulewski, just like my uh, colleague here introduced me. And I welcome you at the presentation entitled Shed Some Light on the Frostpunk. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about global illumination and how it enriched our game. So, first of all, we've already mentioned that we are 11 Studios. I know how many of you know the company, but brief introduction. Uh, we are a company located in Warsaw, here in Poland. Uh, you can know us from games like This War of Mine, which is our famous game, or maybe Anomaly series. And our latest production is Frostpunk itself. Uh, a, few about, a few words about me. Uh, well, I've been working in the company for around like five years, I think. I've been doing various stuff done, uh, there from uh, porting games uh, on other platforms to doing some tools. And then I was doing some uh, heavy AI. And finally, because uh, of one of my hobbies, which is writing my own ga game engine, uh, I moved to the game engine department. Oh, you can, you can contact me at the email below, and it will be also at the end of this presentation, John. OK, so what should we talk about? Uh, first of all, uh, we'll tell a few words about Frostpunk. Uh, then we'll answer the question, why the hell do our own system of global illumination, and why the presentation itself? Then the biggest section, it will be about the implementation, because we are programmers, I assume most of, uh, most of us are here programmers. Uh, and it will be divided on three subsections. It will be baking stage. By baking, I, we understand that we prepare something before the scene actually renders. Uh, then about applying this, those results that were baked to the uh, scene in-game. And the last small point will be integration with the game and with the editor. The next points I'll, in the next points, I'll show you some results. And in the last point will be possible improvements and some questions and answers. So first of all, who has never heard about Frostpunk? OK, especially for you two people. I have a few words. Uh, what's Frostpunk about? So mm, what do, can you know about the game? Well, it's kind of a mix of a city builder, a survival, and a society simulation. Uh, Obviously, as you can, might have seen from screens or, uh, or trailers, it's taking place in a frozen world. And again, we are questioning players' morality. Again, because we've done this in this world of mine, but it's a different kind of game, so prepare to be surprised. Uh, well, it's obvious that we still keep a lot behind closed doors, right? I can't tell you much about the gameplay or anything else, but we can talk about technology. And I can tell you about that uh, since uh, this war of mine, we've improved our rendering pipeline. So we've switched to physically based rendering. Uh, we've improved our shadowing system. So we've introduced cascaded shadow mappings and other features like auto depth biasing, etc. Uh, we have screen space reflections. And of course, global illumination, which is the topic of this presentation. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that we had a global illumination in Anomaly 2, but uh, since then it does not. Uh, meet our requirements for Frostpunk, so we've rewritten it from the very scratch. And at the end, I can show you some uh, screenshots. But before we get to that, I'll have to get through the boring part and my mumble bumble about the code. Uh, so why our own global nation? That was the very first question that organizers from Digital Dragons asked me when I suggested doing a presentation like that. Uh, they asked me why not to use Enlighten uh, some commercial solutions. Well, the answer is simple. Uh, all our games are made on our own technology. It's called Liquid Engine. And we like our in-house solutions because uh, we can always uh, get them to you know, uh, meet specific requirements uh, of our game or our 
designers, especially it's uh, useful for uh, art designers when they are, you know, want some uh, proper tools to uh, work faster. And because, of course, we can. We have a team of a uh, few uh, engine programmers who are ready to meet every challenge and wish of our art, art designers or game designers. So why do another presentation about GI? Well, first of all, uh, let me tell you one thing for you. Uh, this presentation is not about the basic stuff, so if you don't know what spherical harmonics is or what radiance or redundancy is, don't worry because uh, I put a bibliography at the end of this presentation and you, could, uh, you can you know, write or read something and then get back to this presentation. Uh, what I would like to focus uh, here is the implementation details. So you know everything that's happening under the hood uh, by seeing the shader code. I would like to share some experiences in uh, integrating it because uh, when I was tasked to do the global elimination, I've noticed that there is now uh, one source of knowledge that would tell me how to do that properly just as I wanted to. And I hope really to change that by this presentation and by the additional bibliography. And I really hope that it will be a valuable source of knowledge to you. So, the implementation. First of all, how many of you are programmers here? Okay, most of you. So, first, small, small teaser. This is what we are trying to do. This is a scene that you could see probably from uh, the last part of the tra our latest trailer. Uh, we have uh, some light probes here uh, placed. And now we'll be explaining in quite a lot of details how to do that. So, first we have to explain what light probes are. Well, just simply put, this is a kind of entity uh, that uh, provides us information about local light flow. So, uh, it's, it's, uh, usually the local light flow is usually measured in a small volume of space, uh, but it's uh, gathered from a large, a large uh, um, gather range when we are baking them. And the baking st stage itself consists of two main parts. Uh, first, we have to render the uh, scene to the cube map from the, around the point of view of the probe, but this is not the point of this presentation because it's simple. Everyone knows how to render the scene. Um, but the second part is more, more interesting. It's about projecting cube map to spherical harmonics. Uh, first of all, we may not know what spherical harmonics is, so let me put it like this. Uh, we don't listen music to, from the WAV files, but from the MP3 files because of the memory, right? It's a kind of compression. The same goes with the cube maps and spherical harmonics. We don't want to store a few hundred of cube maps. Instead, we can store a few hundred of uh, sets of 27 floats, and we get similar res results when it comes to irradiance. So, baking stage. Uh, when I was first uh, working on the baking stage, I've noticed that we need some refactoring and reorganization of our rendering pipeline because we needed two separate pipelines, one for rendering the scene itself on the screen and the other one for baking the probes. So we probably would like to have a neat and clean high-level solution architecture. That would be a real work saver. And here, when came, here comes the concept of render nodes that solves that. Mm, let me explain what the render nodes are. Uh, it's a high level, quite a high-level concept. Uh, render nodes are a kind of a class that is responsible for doing one render pass. By render pass, uh, I understand uh, doing some set of similar render tasks, like rendering deferred geometry or rendering forward geometry, rendering shadows, or doing some post-process on the scene. Uh, those render nodes can have hierarchical representation, which means that uh, every render node can have its own children, and therefore, when it comes to rendering on this render probe, it will order its children to render and do some tasks for us. Uh, every render node can be configurable and uh, customizable, so um, we can have subclass our base render node. And besides that, uh, if we have two similar render nodes of the same type, we can uh, configure one to be outputting its results to the screen and the other one to some kind of buffer, which is perfect for uh, our requirements of separating the pipelines for rendering probes and rendering the scene. Uh, for instance, we can have pro, uh, render nodes like scene gather render node, which is responsible for rendering whole scene geometry, or light probe gather render node, which is responsible for rendering the uh, geometry for uh, probe baking. And of course, we have post process render node, which, which will have uh, a lot of children for post processing the scene. This is an example of scene gather render node. As you can see, it has some uh, children like deferred geometry. Uh, cascaded shadows. Cascaded shadows itself can have uh, its own children for rendering solid and translucent shadows. Some kind of other children, probably, and 
child-like lighting, and child for rendering FOA geometry. Uh, for comparison, this is light probe gather render node. It's just a simplified version of the scene gather render node because here we have only default geometry. We've decided that we don't need forward geometry for baking the probes. This information uh, is not available for us. Uh, we simplified sh uh, shadows uh, in this pass, and we just also added this lighting. Uh, so, about baking the probes. Uh, if we do it just like we are rendering the scene, uh, we first notice that we are doing some unnecessary stuff, because if we think about rendering the probes, we have to render a few hundreds of probes times six uh, faces of the cubes, so it's quite a lot of uh, rendering to viewports. Uh, first thing we notice is that we don't need to uh, render the shadow map every time we do that. And the first thing we, uh, we, d we did was just pre-render one shadow map for some kind of area of probes, and then use it for other baking. So w w it was a really time saver, and with baking the probes, uh, we always thought that it should be done as fast as possible. Um, the other solution is the one in which we have uh, a situation in which baking the probes does not interfere with scene rendering. It's especially important for our art designers who want to change something and have a result in a few seconds, but in the meantime, uh, they are not, you know, uh, their attention is, is still focused on the screen and what's happening in the scene with the scene. Um, so, we've divided our baking stage on three phases, which takes place on, uh, through the compute shaders. Of course, we could do that on the CPU, but uh, as I've already told you, we wanted it to be as fast as possible, so take around maybe a few seconds or more. And because of that, uh, specific requirements of the uh, compute shaders, we have to divide it at least at two phases. The first pass shader uh, does some initial projection onto spherical harmonics from the cube map. So at this stage, we have a rendered cube map around the probe, and we're passing this cube map to the first shader. Let's assume that this cube map has the size of 32, and we are using three band spherical harmonics, which in practice means that we have nine spherical harmonics coefficients per RGB channel, so nine spherical harmonics per uh, three channels means that we have 27 floats uh, to, as a result. Mm. In this shader, we're processing the cube map by processing one row in each group, in each compute group. So the dispatch params are as follows one per uh, 32 per six on the groups count, six because we have six cube faces, and 32 because we are dividing uh, cube map to be doing 32 operations at once. So the trace count is 32 per one per one because we will be processing this compute shader uh, 32 texels of the cube, cube map at once. Now, here we have some uh, shader code, and the first one. And if the aim of this presentation would be to bore you to death, I would totally go through with explaining each line and, and telling what does it do, etc. But this code is just left as a reference. So later online, when you can get this presentation and look at it, you'll understand how this works. But luckily for us, I'm not the type of person that would like to bore you. Uh, so I'll just give you a bigger picture now. What about those, what those sections are doing, okay? And just stop in the more interesting parts. So, uh, in this first pass shader, first thing we want to do is to get direction from cube center to text on the cube. Once we have that direction, we could sample the radiance map from the cube, uh, cube map. And, and this uh, way of doing it from a document called Stupid Spherical Harmonic Tricks, uh, once we are doing it, uh, we are sampling uh, the radiance map, and they're just projecting it on the spherical harmonics. Before we, uh, before we do that, we have to scale it through the a differential solid angle for that text on the cube map. Uh, then, if we have, at this point, we have uh, 32 results of spherical harmonics projected. Uh, we want to add them all together. Uh, so, what, so what we are doing is we are uh, passing them to the group shared memory, so that in the next section, we could add them all together. Well, the simple way to adding 32 numbers in the array would be just to order one thread to uh, perform a simple loop from 0 to 32, add them together to one number. But we want to parallelize this as much as possible. So what we're doing is basically we're getting an array of 32 uh, digits. We're dividing it in two, adding one half to another, dividing it into an another time, and uh, and at the end, we have only one number, which is the sum of all the 32 coefficients. That's what that code below here do, does. Of course, there's a, 
uh, synchronization at proper stages. After that, we have uh, 27 coefficients, so we can store them on the uh, temporary buffer. The buffer is temporary because uh, it's going as an input to the next shader, next uh, pass of the shader. So, at this point, we have summed up from our cube map every row, so we are left with uh, 32 columns and six faces. Once again, we have to add the results together, and for that, we are using second pass shader. Uh, once we add them up, we have to renormalize them by the all weights applied in the first pass. Again, uh, this, uh, this is a code fragment based on the stupid spherical harmonic tricks. This weight can be computed as follows and passed to the shader. So, uh, the reduction will, will have dispatch params as follows. Um, first, it has group counts of 1 per 9 per 1, because we have 9 spherical harmonic coefficients per RGB channel. And the thread counts will be 32 per 3 per 6. 6 because we have three, 3 cube faces to process, 32 because we have 32 columns to process, and 3 because we'll be operating on 3 separate RGB coefficients. So the first thing we do in that shader is uh, reading the data from the temporary buffer from the first pass, storing it in the group memory, and after we do that, we do again the same trick of adding 32, para, 32 numbers by dividing the array in two and adding one half to the other. Just, simple, just, just a simple adding, nothing happens here. After that phase, uh, we are left with uh, only adding six uh, results from the six phases of the cube, and we are doing it here, scaling it by, by the weight passed from the CPU, and finally, we are writing the output uh, to the buffer. And that's, at this stage, we have projected a cube map on a spherical harmonics, so we have 27 floats stored in the, in the texture. But there comes the third phase that's, uh, that is, uh, that's only made for the coefficients uh, to, to be, it's called, maybe I'm put it that way. Uh, the third phase could be probably a merge with the second phase, but I've added it for clarity and left it as that because uh, in this phase I want to rearrange the parameters uh, for efficiency. And so far we have our uh, coefficients starting texture like in a manner RGB, 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 and we want them to do some reorganizing so that we have first for red, for green, and for blue coefficients. This is for linear and constant polynomials of the spherical harmonics. Then we want to store in a texture second for red, for green, for blue coefficients, which is for four quadratic polynomials. And finally, the last three coefficients, RGB, final quadratic polynomial. So at the end, we, have, we are using a texture of float four to store the spherical harmonics at the size of seven per max probes count. Now, once we, are, we have done that, this is a shader uh, for rearrangement. And this is, uh, nothing fancy happens here, just small rearrangement and pre-multiplying by shader, uh, by a spherical harmonics constant. And once we've done that, reprojection from spherical harmonics to diffuse, which we want to do uh, in the next stage in the lighting, is simple because it takes only six dot products, uh, some uh, other formula of, like multiplication, simple, and adding those three groups together. And at this stage, we have this fuse irradiance from the baked probe. So we have baked our probes. We have all the results stored uh, in the texture. And now the question is how to apply this to our scene. Well, if we think about it, um, we have a few hundred light probes, which is quite a similar task uh, to rendering a few hundred of point lights. But the main difference is that when we have uh, point lights in a close area, those point lights, when they're lighting, they're uh, summing the in their influences together. When the light probes uh, do their lighting, uh, they're storing some information about the light. So probably we, when we have uh, some uh, light probes in a close area, uh, they're storing almost similar information, but it changes slowly over, uh, over the distance. So we want to not add the influences, but interpolate it through one and to, to the other probe. There's always also the assumption that we have one global probe. This is a simplification, really, that when uh, the probes does not, do not have na local neighbors, then we are interpolating it to the global one. And the same goes when we have not, no local probes at all at scene. Now, the most important part that I wanted to do it is to do it in one pass. So. 400 lights or 400 probes are, do, are done in one light. How to do that? 
Uh, well, this is the main points for uh, rendering global animation in one pass by tiled deferred rendering, by tiled rendering. Uh, first thing we want to do is to divide the screen space to square tiles to parallelize the computation because everything will be happening on the, another compute shader. Then we'll run compute shader to determine probe's visibility in each of these tiles. And at the end, once we have uh, all our light probes called, we can either do the shading or write the indices of the light probes for further processing, for instance, if we are using forward plus rendering. Now, how to divide the screen? Uh, at first, well, we want to uh, each of the tiles be computed by one thread group. Uh, the direct is 11. Let's us uh, have the maximum size of group group uh, to 1,024 threads. And the last uh, thing we need to have in mind is that the number of threads in a thread group should be multiple of 64 because of the performance reasons. As far as I remember, it's a kind of feature that's called dual warp scheduling. So the likely candidates for the division of the screen are 8 per 8, or 16 per 16, or 32 per 32. Uh, we could experiment with the various uh, divisions and check what are the, uh, what is the, wh which one division is the, first, the fastest one. But uh, for now, let's just assume we are using 16 per 16 uh, thread group. We can imagine a screen division like that. So we have a part of the screen divided into uh, tiles, which have the size of 16 per 16. Now, uh, what are those tiles for? Uh, First, we want, as I've already told you, we want to determine probe's visibility in each of these tiles. Well, so each of these tiles actually needs a kind of a subfrustum that can be pre-computed because uh, if you think about it, those frustums are in view space, so uh, we need to recompute them only when the screen resolution changes. And you can also notice that only four of the sides of the, this frustum can be computed because uh, we can compute near and the far plane because we don't know the actual depths of the, what we will be having on the screen. At, it has to be deferred until the cooling phase. We can imagine the sub frustum like that. Now, uh, I won't uh, get into details in the shader of uh, pre-computing those tiles because I've put it at the end of the presentation and it's quite a simple thing to do, but the main points of doing that is First, computing corner points of tile in screen space, then transforming them from far clipping space into the view space, and on the last point, we have uh, enough information to build the thrust and planes from three points. I position, which is of course zero, zero, zero because it's a view space, and two corner points. Now, finally, we can shade the scene. Uh, the main points of shading the scene by using our uh, pre-computed light probe information uh, is first computing the minimum and maximum depth of the tile, then cooling the probes for visibility uh, and write the indices on the uh, group uh, memory. And at the last section is either shading the tile in the compute shader or storing the indice of the um, light probe to the memory for, for the processing like forward plus rendering. First, how to compute min and max depth for the tile. Well, in this group, each of the threads can uh, read the depth and compare it with the uh, other depths by, by using some atomic operations. Uh, the only thing here, because it's nothing complicated, is that we don't have atomic operations on floats on compute shaders. So we have to reinterpret them as unsigns, the depths we have to write to unsigns, then do some atomic operations like interlocked mean, minimum and interlocked maximum, and after that, reinterpret back them to the floats. Apart from that, there's some uh, initialization, initialization here and also uh, some uh, pre-caging of the data for a global probe. Uh, now you can wonder why there's magic number of 14, uh, which is the um, number of coefficients times two, but it will become clear later because uh, basically we are, I'm using here blending of two sets of indirect illumination data. So after that, after having minimum and maximum depth, we can uh, know what are the uh, far and uh, near clipping planes. Once we have that, we can do the cooling. Now, we can notice in the shader here that uh, we are going through the, all the list of the light probes, but it's quite unnecessary because if I have to be honest, this should be done first on the CPU. The first cooling should be done on the CPU, passed then on the GPU, and our compute shader here should work only on those probes which were, which were pre-cooled on the CPU. 
but for simplification, because it's our, it, need, it meets our needs, we are just doing the whole list here. So first, we are checking if our bounding sphere of the probe is in the frustum, in the four sides. And if it is, we are checking if it's between the planes. And if it is, then we are doing the interlocked add on the probe count, so we can write uh, our probe index on the proper place in the array, in the group array. Uh, the next section is pre-caching some probe data, which is quite simple to do, thing to do. Just every thread reads some data and stores it in the group memory so that we can avoid some textual lookups later. After we have that, we are going to the main section of this uh, shader. Well, you can notice that until this stage, every shader was responsible for cooling uh, some probes. And now, after that, every shader will be responsible for shading one pixel on the screen. So this is a simple thing to do. We are just doing the same thing that probably would do with point light. We are going through the list of probes. We are applying, uh, we are computing how much light the, does it give us to the final result uh, by simply computing this attenuation in a very simple way. And we are also this adding this attenuation as a total influence, which will be used uh, in a while. It's quite a simple code here. So the last stage, mm, as I've already told you, we're using some kind of a global probe to refer to when there's no light probes at all. So uh, it can have uh, influence from zero to one. It's computed by the total influence that we have some from local probes. Um, we're blending here from the uh, from this light to the global probe light, and nothing happens here except for uh, applying some uh, Lambertian, your favorite term, if uh, of your choosing. And then you can see a division at the end, uh, which uh, which is the difference between what we would be doing with point lights and light probes. So we're dividing the total light computed from the light probes by total influence, and at last we are storing the result in the global light buffer. So this is all when it comes to lighting the, uh, the scene. Now the next section, integration with the editor. Well, uh, we've done some tools and we've, uh, we want our artists to bake the probes for the scene they want, with the settings they want. And if we've just given them the tools, you know, and told them, hey man, just place like 500 entities on the scene by hand, they would probably cry and tell that they won't do that because it's quite an arduous task to be, to be honest. So we we'll introduce some simple form like arrangers. Arranger is a kind of entity that can spawn other entities. It can have its own size and uh, be configured to spawn some, uh, some number of entities. And can come in shape like rectangle, silk, or ring, etc., whatever you want. But we still wanted, after arranging it, uh, to be able to manually correct position one by one by hand. This is an uh, example of the arranger. Just a circle arranger of light probes, which are not baked really because they're all black. It really helps with setuping the scene uh, easily. Now, as for the g integration in the game, well, Frostpunk can be very demanding because we have a full daytime cycle in the game, so we require data for full daytime cycle. Uh, changes of weather in that game may also be an issue, so we can ha we have to take account for that. And as the game is a city builder we have ever-changing geometry. So that's a complicated, quite, quite complicated issue. Now, as for the day cycle, mm, we can notice that radiance various change, changes slowly over time. So we could totally blend two sets of data, and no one would, would notice that something weird is happening. And that's actually what should be done. So we have to pre-bake our light data every three to four hours of the game time of the game time in the game store two sets of data on the GPU, and as the game progresses, we have to just lerp those two sets of data. Uh, we can notice that not really much data needs to be re-uploaded, because for 512 probes, we just only have to upload something like 27 kilobytes, so it's not much. Uh, additionally, we could just divide it for a few frames, but I don't think it's needed. As for the changes of weather problem, well, this is uh, still under research and development, because uh, I think that adding a third, uh, third set of data for LERPing would be quite an overkill, so I didn't want to do that. But possible solutions to this problem that I've seen in some other games, like I think Assassin's Creed 4, or, or maybe other part, would be to multiply GI result by some predefined color by the graphics. So 
when we are baking, we have to bake at light in the neutral uh, conditions. And then if uh, the weather changes, just multiply it by some color and should give us plausible result. Or we can also store scan and sky and sun visibility uh, along the spherical Kármánikus coefficients and from that decide what, sh what can we do in the shaders. This is a matter of research and development and depends what the artists say and how, how much do they like uh, what we've done. Now, the last part, oh, almost the last, pa last part, are the results. So, first of all, for the scene that I will present to you, I used some high-end gaming GPU unit, but it's a reasonably high-end GPU unit. Uh, I, had, I have placed 400 probes on the scene. Uh, for that, we have one light bounce. Why only one light bounce? Well, uh, because our artists just liked it and they didn't require anything more. So when our artists are happy, we programmers are also happy, that's obvious. Um, the baking times for one set of data of the daylight parameters was around three and five seconds. So it's really not that much because one light probe took, took approximately 10 milliseconds, below 10, mi 10 milliseconds, and nine seconds whole time with the processor. Uh, as for the shading time, it took approximately uh, 1.5 milliseconds to 2 milliseconds, which is quite a lot when it comes to the budget of 16 milliseconds per frame or 32 milliseconds per frame if we are aiming at uh, 30 FP FPS. Um, but we could uh, optimize it by some simplification of spherical harmonics, maybe doing less bands, or just changing the base even of the uh, global illumination. And the other solution, of course, is to uh, put, m put less probes on the scene. So the results. Uh, first, the screen that I've already showed you, the placing of the probes looks like that. This is a scene with uh, GI turned off and the GI turned on. So you can notice the difference at the top end of the crater, for instance, or in the shadows, how it goes, uh, how it changes uh, over the distance from the lit area. And goes, uh, it gets some kind of plausible results. So it's uh, GI on. And uh, only the ambient term from the GI component looks like that. Other example, uh, please note the top level of the crater, GI on. You can notice how it possibly be uh, the light possibly reflects uh, from uh, in the shadows. The J component looks like that for this scene. For this scene. Uh, next example. Again, uh, the effect will be most visibly on the top edge. J on, and J off. J on, and the ambient ambient component looks like that. And the last example, global animation is off and on, off and on. And the J component looks like that. Of course, for that solution that I presented to you, have many possible improvements because it's still under research and development. Well, first thing that I'd like to do is uh, give more light bounces. Probably our artists would be much more happy if they got uh, more plausible results. It's quite a simple thing to do because when I was baking stage, I used black ambient. But we, if we wanted more light bounces, we, just, we could just put the results from the first pass of baking to for the second pass of baking and do some iterations. Three to four iterations maybe, which gives us three to four light bounces, which probably go, gave us a much better result. Um, probably we could optimize it to bake uh, in two phases instead of three that I've already mentioned. But maybe for quality, we'll leave it just like that as it is. Um, I, if you noticed, I didn't tell anything about solving the changing geometry problem uh, because it can, be can, it can be quite complex because I would like to have an in-game rebake and once we optimize the game and change maybe some assets, uh, we could probably try to uh, rebake uh, our probes as the geometry changes in the game. Uh, it could be done when uh, the game has phases of lower, uh, lower um, demand on the GPU. Uh, there's also a problem of light leaking, leak, uh, light leaking fix, which does not concern our game here, probably because we wanted uh, this global nation to be on a large scale area, but this problem touches a problem uh, touches a situations in which we have an interior and an exterior, and we have we can notice a light leak from the exterior to the interior. But I think there are, I've seen a document that solves that problem. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention is the reflectance probes that we could have for the reflections, which would be also adding uh, much to the visual experience. 
maybe we would like to switch to Forward Plus pipeline to get better results uh, as it comes with the effic efficiency and add some other GI bases. So uh, when we have a uh, when we don't have a GPU units uh, which is fast enough, we can switch to the other settings which are simpler, like not using three bands uh, of spherical harmonics, but only two, or even one constant color, and we could still get some GI results. So that's all of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I think that you can still ask me. If not, you can write me at the email uh, there. Uh, in other cases, you can meet me at the booth at here at Digital Dragons. And I'll th I think that the presentation will be online because after that, there's some bibliography and some additional shader code. So thank you. Any questions? Hello, if you write your shaders in HLSL and you use the data type half, you should know that it's just an alias for float. So if you want to get real half floats and list on the GPUs that support it, you should use type min 16 float because halves basically don't work. Yeah, that's a, that's a valuable uh, remark because uh, I've already told, uh, told that in my engine team, but we just always use half floats and I mean halves, and it just left us that as you know uh, some kind of a uh, thing from the past. It that does not lo really matter anymore. Yeah, we will change that. Thank you. Any other questions? No questions at all. Not about the game or anything. Okay. Any questions? So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.